This morning I want to read from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Church, we have much to praise this morning. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we are just so thankful for you. Lord, if we just had a moment of time to evaluate our lives, we just see that we owe everything to you. We have so much to be thankful for, so much to, to praise your name for this morning. And Lord, I just pray that, that we're able to see that. Would you give us eyes to see your goodness this morning? Would you give us eyes to see who we really are in light of your goodness? Help us to be thankful for that. Help us to see you as the great and mighty Savior that you are. Help us to worship and give you all honor and glory this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's stand and worship together.
Gracious Father, we just thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you for music. Thank you for getting to sing praises to you. Thank you for your word. And Lord, as we open your word, we just ask to be faithful. We, we ask to be reverent. We, we ask that, God, you would speak to us. We need to hear from you, not from me. Lord, we thank you for this word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church. <clears throat> If you can believe it, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Luke uh, this morning. We've called The Life and Teachings of Jesus, and we've come to the third Sunday in the season of Lent. That's why that cross is there with the purple. Lent has been celebrated by the church going back to at least the third century. Uh, it consists of 40 days, excluding Sundays, leading up to Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
So when you think Lent, <clears throat> what's Lent about? When you think Lent, make it easy for you. When you think Lent, think repent. Think repent. When you think Lent, think repent. It's about turning from sin, turning back to God. We, we recall our sinfulness. We remember God's holiness, twofold things. We remember our need for redemption through the blood of a better covenant. We're going to talk about that today. So last week we looked at the plot to kill Jesus. The chief priests, Judas and Satan, they all played a pivotal part in that plan. And there is no betrayer perhaps more infamous and more remembered than Judas Iscariot. Remember he delivered the Lord uh, into the hands of the priests for the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver. Not, not a lot of money at that time. And in reality, the truth is he didn't sell Jesus, he sold himself. That was, that was the price of his soul. And we hear that verse, and you, it might make you shudder a little bit, as it should. And that verse, what will you give? Or that, that thought, what would you give in exchange for your soul? Right? We should be attentive to the world around us. We, we, the, the, what things have their hooks in us, right? What's, what's my desire? What's my heart's desire? Is Jesus Christ your greatest treasure? Something we can all ask ourselves. And though the plot to kill Jesus was wickedly conspired by enemies of God, it was also a definitive plan of God. Amen? The death of the Lord was both tragic and terrible and beautiful and glorious at the same time. So we'll see more of the divine plan of God continue to unfold as we move closer and closer toward the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the sermon title for today, Last Supper... First, communion. We celebrate communion at liberty. Uh, but when did this communion, when did this sacrament start? Where does it find its genesis, which means origins? Where does communion begin? So for those of us who have grown up in church or have been walking with the Lord for some time, we've heard those words said several times, right? This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in what? In remembrance of me. So we'll be looking at this from the perspective of Luke's gospel, Luke 22, verses 7 through 20. And so something to keep in mind today. What does the Old Testament have to do with the new? A question that came up in small group this past week was, why do some ministries hand out Bibles that only have the New Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. What is that about? Why are they doing that? And I believe it's the intention of going and, and getting, getting hooked on the Word and then going and getting an entire Bible. But anyway, what does it mean when a church defines itself as a New Testament church? Maybe you've heard that before. New Testament church, what's that mean? And the, the issue there is that reasoning can fluctuate depending upon who you're talking to. Which denomination? Which minister? It doesn't always mean the same thing. But regardless of what one means by that, we cannot divorce the Old Testament from the New Testament. Right? We can't divorce the two. And, and, and the New Testament it was how we understand. In fact, the New Testament is how we understand the Old Testament. So, anyway, we should never throw it out and say things like this. Well, God doesn't work like that anymore. You ever heard that one? You know, that's, in the, that's Old Testament. God doesn't work like that anymore. Be careful. Be careful. God is the same what? Yesterday, today, forever. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, did he? No, he came to what? Fulfill the law. Fulfill. There are things that are different under the new covenant, right? There are differences. But be careful with that, not like that anymore. It might, it might be different. And there's, there's different perspectives. And here there's two big words for the day when it comes to continuity and discontinuity. Okay? And that's just a fancy way of saying what things under the old covenant are still happening under the new or what things are different that were under the old covenant that are different under the new covenant. How did Jesus fulfill the law? Where did... Passover come from. We're going to talk about Passover. You cannot talk about communion without talking about Passover. And we'll see that. Why is it the Last Supper 
And where did communion come from? These are all questions we're going to try to answer today. And that's exactly what Jesus shows us here in Luke chapter 22. So let's take a look here, starting at verse 7, all the way down to 20. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters, and tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it, just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when the hour had come, he reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. It's the word of the Lord. All right. The wine of the new covenant is sweeter when we understand the old covenant. Amen? The wine of the new covenant is better when we understand the old. So for the sake of context behind what's going on here, this is the last week of our Lord's life uh, before his death. Passion week is picking up pace. Verse 7 shows us the context there of Passion week. Then came the day of unleavened bread, right? And the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So this is Thursday evening. Thursday evening. And at this point in the Gospels, a lot of things are happening very quickly. But we're getting the play-by-play recorded for us in the moments leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. This is very important. The timing of everything is very important. The timing of this meal is important. The Passover lamb had to be sacrificed to have a Passover meal. And so the meal consisted of lamb, bitter herbs, and unleavened bread. I'm going to go into more detail with this later. The lamb was the sacrifice. The bitter herbs were to remind the Jews of the bitter years they spent in Egypt. And the unleavened bread was symbolic of purging wickedness, sinful tendencies, and corruption out of the people. Leaven is generally associated negatively in the Bible. So having an effect of a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It permeates, just like sin can get inside us and permeate. We've got to purge that leaven from us. And so we can go ahead and get into the first point here. <clears throat> Passover is the oldest festival observed by the Jews celebrating their liberation from Egypt. And there's a lot to flesh out there, but that's mainly what it's about. And so you might be, if you're looking at that, is, for a Christian, should that be an is or a was? Right? Is this something we should keep doing? And, and we come to that idea of continuity and discontinuity. So should Christians still observe feasts? Festivals that were held by Jews. And I'm not going to get into all of it, but it, again, it always depends on what you mean by that. It always depends on what you mean. So speaking of, of Sabbath keeping and Jewish festivals, the, the Apostle Paul, he writes in Romans, he says this, One person esteems one day as better than another, and another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. That means we don't do things just to do them. That means if we observe Lent, we do it purposefully, right? We don't do it just, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I don't know. I heard people give things up. I'm going to give up something that I like or something I don't, I don't like. Kids all joke about that. It doesn't take a kid long to get that either. I, my, uh, I told my daughter that some, of, some traditions of Lent, they, they give things up, and she, 
I don't remember what she said, but it was something that, hey, I don't like that. Can I give that up? But yeah, I don't think that's the idea, sweetie. <laughs> so anyway, if you're a Christian observing Passover, you should not observe it as if you're a Jew. Okay? Let me tell you something. You're not a Jew. You're a Gentile. And that's okay, because Jesus came to die for Jew and Gentile. Amen? And we could have Messianic Jews. They're, they're there. But most of us, by and large, are Gentiles. So we do not have to become Jews to become Christians. And the, there, this is a distinction of the New Covenant. Paul writes elsewhere in the book of Galatians. You've heard this before. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Jew and Gentile alike are saved the same way. Gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, Lent, wonderful uh, tradition to observe, but observing Lent isn't making you more saved. So I'm getting off track. <laughs> what is Passover? Passover is the oldest festival observed by the Jews. It, it had been around 1,500 years old on the night that Jesus is having right here at the Last Supper. It, it reminded the Jews of their liberation from captivity, from being slaves in Egypt. And it finds its beginnings with something we don't remember too fondly, and that's the tenth plague. The tenth plague was where the angel of death entered the homes of all the people in Egypt and killed the firstborn of any who lived in the home. Now, there was a way in which the death angel would pass over a home. And that's if people sacrificed the lamb without blemish and adorned their doorposts with lamb's blood. When the angel saw the blood on the posts, all the firstborn living inside that home were safe under the covering of the blood. No lamb's blood, no safety. The only observance older than Passover is the Sabbath. But both, interestingly, are given before the Mosaic Law is established. So when it comes to Passover, there's, there's an old wineskin that need not be observed under the New Covenant. And we'll get to that soon. But that's exactly what Jesus was doing on the night in the upper room with his disciples. So let's walk through this passage again. Verses 8 through 10. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said, Behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water, that's crucial, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. So John and Peter, they go to prepare the meal. And it's likely, by the way, that they would have already obtained their lamb that Sunday. Somewhere they've got this lamb procured, because that's when you did it, on the 10th of the month. But we'll, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself again. But already, they've got the lamb, but here's, the, here's what's important. No one knew where this supper was going to take place up until this point. Nobody knew, except Jesus, Peter, and now John. And Jesus only sends these two disciples to prepare it. So there's a lot of people in town for Passover, right? We talked about that a little bit last week. At least two million on average, two million people there to observe this feast. It's a pilgrimage feast, which means you go to the temple with your family to observe it. Uh, and it was common for local residents to have rooms available for people to rent out so they could have Passover with their families. And so, on, again, on average, very bloody, by the way. On average, there were about 250,000 lambs sacrificed on a Passover. And as, as far as per family, uh, no less than 10 people shared one lamb and no more than 20 people. So that's where we're getting that number for over 2 million. So at, at first glance, you might think like, all right, so now Jesus is sending us here. I mean, where am I going to find a guy carrying water, right? That sounds difficult, but not culturally because this, this would have been unusual. So as, as, and generally, carrying water was a job given to women. 
So this guy would have been easy to spot. So notice in verse 11, the message to be given to this man was this. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? The teacher has need of it. Right? This sounds familiar. The Lord had need of a donkey. Right? The Lord needs it. The teacher has need of it. The rabbi has need of this guest room. So why do, why do I point that out again? Because this is planned. This is all planned. This is, and there's no chaos going on here from God. This is perfectly orchestrated. It has to take place. And by the way, again, the, the, the other reason for, or likely the other reason for it only being Peter and John was because of what? Judas was set to betray at this point. And he couldn't know where this was going to take place before Jesus did this. So in Matthew 26, 18, Jesus says this. He says, my time is at hand. My time is at hand. The divine plan of God must continue to unfold. The enemy was only partially aware of what was going on. Right? These things, this was a plan of the enemy, but they didn't know how everything was going to work out, clearly. And so it says this in verse 13. It says, and they went and found it just as he had told them. There it is, ready to go. And they prepared the Passover. So there's no slide to what I'm about to read you. Uh, and we, I've given you a brief overview of what this meal consisted of. But now I want to read to you specific instructions given to Moses about the Passover meal. I think this will help us understand it better. So no need to turn there. If you're a note taker, Exodus 12, 1 through 10. Exodus 12, 1 through 10. Here we go. This is where it finds its origins this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And that month's called Nisan. That's not talking about cars. Okay? Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. That would have been Palm Sunday. Okay? Four days later, and we're coming to that, would have been Thursday. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the month when the, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Four days from Palm Sunday is Thursday, 14th day. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread, feast of unleavened bread, bitter herbs, they shall eat it, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall not let, you let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. There you go. That's what's going on. That's what's going on this night. It's not just a, the new covenant just pops up. There's things that are important. Passover, again, the bread was to be unleavened to symbolize their coming out from the Egyptians and being separate, okay? The Jews were God's people. They didn't want, he didn't want this leaven of these pagan gods permeating what they thought. So Passover wasn't just about getting the Israelites out of Egypt, although that is a big part of it. It wasn't just that. It was also getting the Egypt out of the Israelites, You've got to get this Egypt out of here. Many of the Jews had likely begun to think, like we do, if things are going well, God must be, everything must be good. God must be blessing me. If things aren't going well, then it must be because God is cursing me. That's not true. But people naturally think that. So, and these Jews in this situation had likely thought to be, begin to think that the Egyptian gods were more powerful than Yahweh. 
Because after all, they were in captivity to them. And at best, many of them thought these false gods and belief systems were also true. And they needed that leaven that was potentially going throughout their hearts to be removed. They needed taken out of Egypt on the outside, and Egypt needed to be taken out of their hearts on the inside. So the full feast of unleavened bread ran from Nisan 15 to 20. Seven days. Seven days, well, 14. So let's come back to verse 14 in Luke. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. That's a, that's a huge, again, the heart of our Lord is on display there. Earnestly desire to do this. I strongly, he strongly looked forward to this event. He thought Jews would have had fond family memories, right? Been doing this for a long time. Lots of families celebrating the Passover for years and years and years. Passover was about, and Jesus was about to inaugurate something in Passover that had never been done before. More, it was, this, this supper was going to be more than another fond memory. So he was also still thinking of his disciples, right? Up until his death, he's thinking of them. Even amidst suffering. Even with suffering and death in the back of his mind, Jesus was thinking about other people. He was thinking about what he wanted to give to them. The Bible's so true, he loved his own till the very end. It says in verse 16, For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Until can mean a couple different things, okay? Until can mean until the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is, in the new heavens and the new earth, when Jesus returns. Or, this could simply mean that this was the last supper that he would have with them until he died. So, this last supper is also a first when it comes to the kingdom of God under the new covenant. A new covenant in Jesus' blood. And that brings us to the second point. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Right? God is just and merciful, and because God is holy and righteous, he cannot overlook sin. He ceased to be righteous if he just overlooked sin. To keep being righteous, then, he has to exercise wrath against sin. Sin has to be punished, it has to be dealt with. And by the way, this point comes from, this is not my own words, this comes from the Bible. Hebrews Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The Passover lamb's blood was sacrificial, and it was sacrificed on behalf of the family that observed the Passover meal. So we look back at verses 17 and 18 in Luke. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. And he's reiterating what he said in verse 16. So, I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So if you've looked at other accounts, if you've looked at Mark or Matthew here, you might wonder, well, why is Luke talking about two cups? Luke mentions two cups, right? Why don't we have two communion cups? Because it actually goes beyond that, and, and actually, traditionally, Passover was celebrated with four cups. There's a fifth cup argument when it comes to Jesus drinking the bitter cup. Four cups, These cups are representative of God's promises given to Israelites in Exodus 6. Again, I'll just read this to you. Exodus 6, 6 and 7. Promise of God. This is where they get these Passover cups. Say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord thy God, and I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Bring you out. 
Some call that sanctification. There are different names for these guys. It's, you don't have to, don't stress over getting all the names. I will deliver you from slavery, deliverance. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment, redemption, or, or cup of blessing, third cup. And then I will take you and be my people and I will be your God. That's restoration. See, these are the things that Jews would think about as they were partaking Passover meal. And I, again, I know that there's a lot here and I'm not going to test anyone on the four cups of Passover or anything like that, so don't worry. Um, Passover, up until this point, it was being observed as it always was. It's just another Passover. Then what happens next is completely new. Okay, so in verse 19, Jesus takes the bread. And this you've grown up hearing, or maybe uh, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you've heard this said a lot. But when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So usually, the unleavened bread was handed out in silence. We don't talk, we just eat it. Not this time. And also, the Greek word for giving thanks here is eucharisteo. Eucharisteo. Does that sound familiar? Should. Which is where higher church denominations get their term for communion. Eucharist. Same thing. So what does Jesus mean? This, this is my body. What's he talking about? And the disciples must have been fascinated right now. It's like, what? What are you talking about? This is no ordinary Passover meal. This is atonement language. Okay? Jesus is saying, this is me given for you. This is me broken for you. I'm going to die for your sins. Another name for Jesus is what? There's a few names of Jesus, but when you think of bread, what do you think? Bread of life. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. They're eating unleavened bread. Dear friends, is there any leaven in Jesus? Is there any sin in Jesus? And no leaven in the bread he's holding. And he says, broken for you. What was broken? Sometimes we can go a little too far with this. What was broken? Because were, were Jesus' bones broken? No. He's not talking about his bones. John even says, after the soldiers pierced the side of Jesus, John says, these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. So broken? What's that mean? And again, so Jesus was without blemish, Right? No broken, no broken bones. So when we say Jesus is broken for us, we're saying that his life is given for ours. His life is broken so that you might live. He was going to die so that I might live. And so in communion, we remember this sacrifice. This is my body broken for you. Very intimate. Very intimate. Verse 20, likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. Whoa, a new covenant in blood. You see, whether it was Abraham or Moses or on and on, how does God make covenants with blood? blood covenant is a bond in blood biblically defined so what's going on here it's a promise it's a promise from God it's it's a necessary sacrifice we have a new covenant Jesus is using new language we have the blood of the Passover lamb don't we wait now 
Now, I've got some verses for you that I want to throw up. We're going to look at two passages. Exodus 12, 21 through 24. And this is, folks, this is such an amazing topic to condense into 40 minutes. And sometimes I go longer than that. But we're going to get what we can, okay? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to scratch the surface of a glorious truth. So Exodus 12, right in front of you here, 21 through 24. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in it. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. Stay inside. Don't go outside because the safety is under the blood of the lamb. So for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood of the lintel on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. All right. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. So, shouldn't we celebrate Passover? It says forever. Why don't we sacrifice a Passover lamb? God's words say we are to observe this with our families forever. So why aren't we doing it? You got the answer. We have a sacrifice that's been made once and for all. The truth is, and this is why we say that about continuity and discontinuity. This is why we say, hey, what's the Old Testament got to do with the New Testament? A lot! A lot. And this was timed at the right time. And I'm telling you, if you're celebrating Passover still, you better not be celebrating it like a Jew. Because there is a distinction. In truth, we do celebrate Passover. But it's different now. And here's the difference. We have a sacrifice that's made once and for all that the blood of bulls and goats could not atone do you realize that the blood of bulls and goats, it was all types and shadows of things, even when they were doing it in the Old Testament. God's the same yesterday and today and forever. It was all about Jesus. All this blood that's being shed, it's all about Jesus. That bull can't do anything. It's blood on the ground. This is, I'm telling you, this is one of the most glorious truths in all of Scripture. In the New Covenant... Church, I, and, I re, and, and please, if, you, if you're just a New Testament reader, stop it. Be an Old Testament reader too. Because the New Covenant is appreciated so much more when we understand the Old Covenant. One more passage. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. If you want a reason to read your Old Testament, read the book of Hebrews. Read the book of Hebrews. Oh, man, a lot of this stuff doesn't make sense. Hebrews explains it. Hebrews 10, 12 through 18. When Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, there it is, offering, sacrifice, he is perfected for all those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying... This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. And he's quoting Jeremiah. He's quoting the prophet Jeremiah here. I will put my laws on their hearts. I will write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Where there is forgiveness. You see... When Jesus rose that cup to the new covenant in Matthew's gospel, he adds something. He says this, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So church, Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. The lamb has been sacrificed, and so every time we take communion, 
Every time you take Holy Communion, we remember those things. We remember the body of Jesus given and broken for us. The blood of Jesus poured out for us. Jesus is the bread of life. There's no leaven in him at all. And he's the ultimate, the true, and the better Passover lamb. We don't need to go back to that. We don't need to go back to that. Jesus is so much better. Behold, the Lamb of God lifted high upon the cross. Sacrifice once and for all. And a sacrifice that only bulls and goats could point to. The Lamb of God. John, John says what? John the Baptist. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. It's amazing. This is a new and better covenant. The Passover was always about Jesus. Passover was always about Jesus, right? He kept the Passover, and even that, he came down, well, did Jesus violate the Passover? No, he kept it. He kept every law of God up until those final moments. And even the last day during the crucifixion as he hung on the cross at the ninth hour, Lambs were being sacrificed in that temple as the Passover lamb hung high on a cross. That is not what the enemy wanted to do. That's what God planned to do. So there's some distinctions there, and there's some conversations to have about the continuity and the timeline of everything. We could have both. But I only got so much time. This is a remarkable thing. If you get spare time, look up how Jesus, prefer, to how Jesus fulfills the Passover. There's so many things. So many things. And so we sing things like Agnes Day or Agnes Die, however you say it, right? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. You are the Lord. Dear friend, I really hope that our reaction to these deep truths of Scripture don't bring up in us a so what. So what? This is more informative than practical. I'll give you that. Right? This is more informative than practical. But if you need some application, there's a couple things you can think about. Passover was not optional for a Jew. It was not optional. You had to do it. Remember the ten plagues? Some of those plagues were only affecting the Egyptians, right? What about this one? What about the tenth plague? What happened if there wasn't any blood on that doorpost? Didn't matter if you were a Jew or an Egyptian. It was everybody. Passover had to be observed by all people. And the only safety from death available was under the blood of the Lamb. So you got to ask yourself, New Covenant Christian, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? The song says. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can make you clean in the eyes of God. And so death awaits us all. Are you ready for it? Jesus is the only refuge from the wrath of God. There's only safety under the blood of the Lamb. And now the second thing. And I hope this encourages you. Do you ever feel like you've gone too far? Boy, I really stepped in it this week. I stepped in it this morning. Probably going to step in it again tonight. I don't, I don't um, uh, recommend planning to sin. But anyway... You ever feel like you've gone too far? God, God's never going to forgive me. I've sinned too much. And so I ask, dear friend, do you need rest? Do you need encouragement? Because perhaps there's no, nothing stronger than the types and shadows right here in front of us. The Jews would take their Passover lamb to the temple. The Israelites didn't go up there and get inspected. It was the lamb that got inspected. Is there any blemish on this? Is 
there anything wrong with this? The priests didn't inspect the people. They inspected the lambs brought to them. They inspected the sacrifices. And so, if the lamb was out without blemish and met those qualifications, the animal would be an acceptable sacrifice on behalf of the family. Do you know what God the Father says about God the Son? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Right? And so, Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life, but we didn't. We don't. We're sinners. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. So how can we have hope? Because in Jesus, the wrath of God owed to you is satisfied. Passover is all about that. Jesus, Jesus, have we put our faith in Jesus? And if you have put your faith in Jesus, do you still fear judgment? I don't want to be judged i got to sit at the Bema seat, right? Yes, you do. But, fear not. Because if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then your sins will not be inspected. Your faults will not be inspected. The Christian's works are judged, but their sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Because the spotless Lamb of God is all your hope and all your righteousness. When, what, and it, so, so church, if, you, if you're bouncing around, if you're on the treadmill, it's like, man, I messed up too much this time. What are you putting your hope in? What are you putting your hope in? I sinned again. When the, when, like that song we sing, when the night is dark, when I am not forsaken, the price it has been paid. There's a song we used to sing. I used to sing it with my family. It says this. Christ is a sure and steadfast anchor. Sometimes temptation claims the battle, and it seems the night has won. But you know, we have a sure and steadfast anchor in Jesus Christ, right? And when temptation claims the battle, and it seems the night has won, deeper still then goes the anchor. Though I justly stand accused, I will hold fast to the anchor. It will never be removed. You see, we have hope because the Passover lamb who has been sacrificed once and for all is inspected on your behalf. And when God the Father looks at God the Son, this perfect lamb, all creation breaks out in praise. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. This is my beloved son. There is safety in his blood. Worship team, come up. Communion is something that we can do in remembrance of the Lord that can provide us great comfort and hope, right? We take communion, you should always be in a reflective mode. That's what you're supposed to do. Remember, remember, remember. And so we look back to what Jesus said. We look back to this new inauguration, this new covenant that happened. We went from Passover to communion. We look back to it and we remember what Jesus said. The body broken, the blood poured out, and we're encouraged. Because Jesus was broken for us. Jesus' blood has covered us. And so we look forward to whatever life brings us because we have hope due to that. It's not up to me. Amen? It's not up to me to save me. And when we do it, we look forward as well because as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, what are we doing? We're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. What a marriage supper awaits us in heaven. The last supper was also the first of many communions. And dear friend, do you know the Lord? The Lord is with you. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we receive by faith in Jesus Christ. 
And so again, Lord, we pray that those who don't know the Passover lamb would come and find refuge under the blood. There is forgiveness of sins and they are cast as far as the east is from the west. Help us turn to you. Give us the sure and steadfast hope that is in Jesus. Give us grace that we can give you glory and even give you praises through song now in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand. Elders, if you want to come up, if anybody needs anything to pray about, we'll be we're glad to pray with you. We'll be standing up here. But other than that, we're going to sing praises to God.
Amen. Thank you, ladies. I want to become more aware. That's kind of a hot topic, right? I want to become more aware of the presence of God. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also want to encourage you, dear friend, that even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. Because the Holy Spirit is always with us. Even until the end of the age. So, I pray that he continues to guide, to lead us, and bring us comfort. He's the God of all hope.